So I'm, I'm just going to say a, a few words to, um, to open then uh, today um, and then we'll, we'll hand over. So uh, thank, thanks to everyone for, for signing up and obviously a massive thank you to, uh, to the guys that have agreed to speak today. Um, a, a bit of background uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Barry Cranford. I'm the founder of the London Java community. Um, I'm not a developer myself. I run a tech recruitment company called RecWorks. Uh, so here at, at RecWorks, we've been on a mission for the last 12 years to uh, to find ways that recruitment can be a force for good in the tech industry beyond just getting people jobs uh, and that's been specifically around learning mentoring and, and career development so so we aim to create groups and platforms where we connect people that want to learn with with others that want to share and that can be on a group basis uh, with events like today and communities like the ljc or or on a one-to-one -one level um, so we introduce mentors and mentees through uh, meet, the Meet to Mentor platform and, and do a lot, a lot of things like that on a one-to-one on -one basis. Um, most recently, we've been, been playing with this concept that's somewhere between the two of these, these small, smaller groups, smaller learning groups. Uh, and one of these groups is called Aspiring Speakers, in which we're, we're aiming to encourage a new diverse generation of speakers. Uh, so this, this event is part of this, um, of, of this, this initiative. Uh, and, and the idea is to provide a safe place for people to practice and, and get feedback while, while obviously entertaining you guys as, as the audience. Um, there is one, one thing I'd like to ask, um, and I'll ask after each talk, but um, feedback, feedback is so important to new speakers. Um, so if there's any, uh, if anyone has got any feedback, please do share it. Uh, we'll, we'll hand out a form uh, on the chat uh, very soon. Um, and so, so yeah, please keep some ideas on, on what you do like and, and, and yeah, any, any kind of words of, of warm encouragement would be great. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dan. Um, so Daniel Zorowski is going to be uh, speaking on hypermedia driven RESTful web service with Clojure, Liberator, HAL and Open tele Telemetry. Um, and Dan's a senior software engineer at Crew, which is a startup where he's helping build a digital bank where money meets friends. So, Dan, when you're ready. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be presenting here. Barry uh, actually set me up with my first graduate job uh, about 10, 10 years ago uh, or so. Uh, so it's always nice to, to be able to do this. Um, OK, let me try and share my screen. Uh, OK. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Fantastic. Okay, so um, just to kind of set up the, the scene, I'll try to fit this within five minutes and then leave uh, two, three minutes for, for questions. Um, I'm going to uh, try to absolutely blast through this. Uh, so if anyone who's uh, eating now and having lunch, I hope that's not going to give you some uh, indigestions. Um, the purpose of this talk is not to introduce closure and not really kind of showcase uh, closure. It's, it's, it's more of a general kind of concept about how you can build um, RESTful APIs uh, that are conformant to the HTTP specification, um, leveraging just uh, the HTTP protocol and uh, JSON. Uh, so most organizations' uh, internal APIs are a mess. Uh, we all build APIs almost every single day. Uh, we use tools like Swagger. We use tools like GraphQL. Um, a lot of the time, GraphQL is, um, is a bit um, too much f for just building a simple sort of internal API. And the, the tr truth be told, I think a lot of people will build simple kind of HTTP resources not using GraphQL. Uh, and then they would uh, slap a swagger on top of it, but then nobody ever even looks at the swagger console. Um, so you, you kind of have it, you, you kind of have the perception that you can interact with it, but nobody really uh, uses it. Um, so um, I would like to introduce you to hypermedia driven RESTful web services. So the uh, the concept here is we want to leverage just HTTP and JSON to, to be able to do uh, service discovery and service uh, traversal and getting kind of fetching resources across uh, across services. Um, so, so there's a couple of concepts I'd like to introduce and then I'll show a very quick demo. So the first uh, concept is uh, this Richardson maturity model. Uh, that there's, a, uh, there's a very interesting article on Martin Fowler's website that talks about uh, the, the four different levels, uh, level zero being 
just basically HTTP. So we're just saying we're using HTTP, nothing else. Level one is where we're saying, okay, so now that we're using HTTP, uh, we will be um, referring to things using resources. So for example, slash orders slash one, which means that's the number one, the first order from our order service. Level two is HTTP verbs. So let's say uh, post, delete, get uh, kind of semantics. Um, and this is usually where, where it ends. So internal APIs usually either stop at this point or maybe they will have a GraphQL, but a lot of the time they will not have GraphQL, they will maybe have some Swagger on top of it, but Swagger only really gives you these uh, three levels. Um, so a third level is, uh, is this hypermedia controls where you can add an element of discoverability and links using um, hypermedia. Um, but before I get to that, um, and before I show you the demos, just to provide again a little bit more concept, um, the, the demo um, is a very simple um, Apples and Origins incorporated e-commerce store where you basically have two services like orders and, uh, and items. Uh, and we're using a Clojure uh, Liberator framework, which is uh, an HTTP kind of compliant framework that allows you to very easily declaratively define your uh, resources and kind of separate it from the uh, you know, from the, separate the actions such as the post, the puts, the deletes and patch from the various HTTP decisions that you have to make. Uh, a decision, what I mean by that. So for example, um, in HTTP semantics, uh, you sometimes you might want to say that the resource doesn't exist and return an appropriate HTTP error code. Or you might want to say um, handle okay, so you want to return 200 with the resource. Or maybe you want to return non-authorized. Uh, so, so essentially, in Liberator, the way you uh, implement your RESTful web services, you uh, create a function uh, that returns a map uh, where you have these uh, different keywords like uh, exists, question mark, and you provide a function where you return true or false, whether a resource exists or not. Uh, then you have, let's say, a function like handle okay, where you just return the, like your collection of resources. Uh, so that, that basically covers level zero one to two, uh, zero one two. So the first three levels of uh, the richness and maturity model. And uh, just to continue on this, um, Liberator, the, the closure framework uh, is quite fantastic because it allows you to create these very conformant HTTP um, RESTful web services um, in a, a fairly easy way. So on the Liberator website, uh, which I encourage you to, to check out after this call, you have this uh, really cool um, graph that shows you um, the exact execution of the checks that Liberator checks. So it checks whether you provided um, any or all of these different kind of keywords, keywords to function mappers and checks what the decision should be. Um, so it sort of abstracts everything away from you. Um, so, so that covers the first three levels. And then uh, moving on to the, the hypermedia element, um, in, uh, in order to, to be able to discover uh, resources across services, uh, you need something a little bit more elaborate than just JSON because JSON, uh, you know, it's, it's a great sort of transport protocol, but it doesn't really have any sort of defined semantics for, for links. So like if you think about the web, uh, the reason why the internet became so popular was because it was very easy to kind of discover the various different resources through the, the use of links. So you go onto a website, you click on a link and it takes you to another website. And then on that website, you see a bunch of different resources and you click on some of these resources and you can kind of traverse it. Uh, but unfortunately, most of our like internal APIs don't have that capability of being able to traverse this. So Hypermedia attempts to solve this problem. And there are uh, lots of different implementations of this. Uh, I think these two are most popular ones. So JSON hypertext application language um, and uh, web linking. So JSON hypertext application language is the one that I'm going to be presenting here. Here it's called HAL, hypermedia application language. And there are various implementations in pretty much every language. Uh, here, for example, you, you can see there's an example here for Spring. If you do Java Spring, um, it's under the Hypermedia SD engine of application state. It's a bit of an unfortunate acronym, uh, HATE OS. It doesn't sound very 
uh, very nice, uh, but it stands for Hypermedia as the state of, uh, as the engine of application state. Um, so what is HAL? So HAL uh, is simply just vanilla JSON. It confirms to a well-defined RFC of how these links should look like. Um, and uh, yeah, so like if, uh, you know, you wouldn't use Swagger to, to browse the web. So why would you use Swagger to browse uh, links between your services? Uh, how kind of solves that problem for you? Um, and it also has a, 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 another very interesting property because when you build your APIs around these HAL resources, um, it's about um, sending links to the, the to, to the definite source of truth of a particular entity. So you're normally, uh, you know, you don't want to be sending your entire state in your Kafka messages or between your HTTP posts between services because then you end up kind of proliferating that state. So it's much better to send a link to that original resource and that's what HAL is for. Um, so um, some of my colleagues at Crew uh, built a closure library that allows you to build these HAL resources. It's called Hellboy. Uh, we use this extensively for many of our microservices in, uh, internally. In fact, all of our services talk using HAL, uh, which is simply just HTTP, but uh, like JSON responses that look like the one on the right-hand side. Uh, you see here the get to 100, um, you know, when I ask, uh, for you know users I, I get this kind of JSON which additionally has these sort of links to the original entity um, so on the left this is kind of how you would assemble it uh, in your service uh, you would create a resource add some properties to it add some links to it and then on the right this is kind of how you consume it so you use a discovery endpoint that gives you all the links and then you can kind of traverse it um, so that's uh, that's that Dan, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to come in here. I'm afraid you're you're running at nine minutes. Um, oh, so, nine minutes <laughs> wow. um, okay. it, it got away. Um, do you mind maybe hanging around afterwards to uh, if there's um, if we can finish it after after the others? Is is that okay? Yeah, no, no problem. I mean, that was that was kind of the um, uh, the the bulk of it. So uh, yeah, I encourage you to check out these. Uh, these uh, resources. I wanted to show you some code samples uh, on my GitHub profile. We can find this project called HAL Liberator Jaeger, where I actually have uh, a simple project made of two services, and it's also hooked up to to Jaeger for distributed tracing. But I kind of I thought I won't be able to really present this in full, so maybe at uh, at another occasion. Cool. Thanks. A hundred percent. Thanks so much. It's it's so tough, isn't it? Trying to uh, trying to get through so much and keep it all within the uh, the seven minutes. Yeah. Um, we did have one of the early events where everyone ran over um, to sort of 10, 11 minutes. Um, and so, so yeah, so sorry to, uh, sorry to cut you off. Um, but um, yeah, any, um, if, if you can hang around afterwards, um, then, then yeah, we can set up a uh, First, yeah. room and, and, and people can, can ask any further questions. Apologies for the screaming children in the background, by the way, if that, that noise is, uh, is coming through. Um, Helen, are you, oh, uh, feedback. If, if, everyone's, if anyone's got any feedback, please do use the feedback form. Um, so Don Carlo has kindly just posted that in the in the chat. So please um, yeah, fill fill that in if you don't mind. Um, Helen Scott is up next with uh, three corporate myths about developers. Um, so Helen is a developer advocate at JetBrains um, and has had a very interesting career journey uh, that I went through with her recently, actually as a as a product owner and technical writer and enjoys learning new technologies. So Helen, awesome, thanks Barry. Uh, everyone can see my screen, okay? Perfect, thank you. So yeah, I'd like to talk to you today about three corporate myths that I've heard about developers uh, in the last two decades. Some of them are, are repeatable. Firstly, a little bit about myself. Uh, Barry's already covered a lot of this. So I've recently joined JetBrains as a Java developer advocate, previously Java developer, um, product owner, technical writer, all sorts really. Uh, I am exceptionally passionate about communication and fun fact, I absolutely hate bananas. Uh, I do have some ex-colleagues on this call as well as some current colleagues who can vouch for this fact. They are the worst thing in the world to me. So with that, let's move on to myth number one. Okay, developers love to learn. So it's fine to ask them to do it in their own time. So I really wanna challenge this myth. I think that we enjoy playing with new stuff. I think we enjoy playing with the latest release. I think we find things fun but there is a difference between 
wanting to play with the new stuff, the latest and greatest and poking it and seeing what happens and actually getting dedicated time to do the training that you need to do your job well. Um, I have personally fallen foul of this. I have spent a good portion of my career being too timid to ask for this time to gain these skills, even though it's been directly related to my career. Um, that's a great path to burnout. Don't recommend it. Um, yes, we all have to stay current, but what I, would, um, what I would say is, especially in this current climate that we're all in, this learning needs to be managed, especially if it's on the job learning, it needs to be managed as part of your job as much as possible. You know, a lot of us have families at home. It's very trying circumstances as well. I would encourage you that if it's learning that is linked directly to your job, ask your employer for the time. Find out, um, put together a really lightweight business case, find out how they can actually support you to gain these skills because this, this notion that we love to learn, therefore we'll do it all in our free time is, um, it's not a particularly helpful one as far as I'm concerned. Okay, myth number two. This is potentially my favorite myth. I think you're all gonna recognize it. Developers are terrible at estimating. Therefore, it's okay to beat them up about it. Um, we've all been there. I've been there. I've, I've been the one in the room that said, this will take me half a day. And two weeks later, it's not done. Um, it's, it's exceptionally challenging and I, I really want to understand why, why we find estimating so freaking hard because we do, it's the same the world over. Um, so I came to the conclusion that potentially the, the more accurate question we need to ask was why are they so bad? And I realized it's because of unknowns. It's almost always unknowns. It's unknowns, it's unforeseen issues. It's like saying to a developer, here's a piece of string, tell me how long it is, but I'm not gonna tell you how many knots I tied in it. We don't know, right? You have no idea how to actually estimate that piece of string or say with any kind of reliability how long it's going to take. So for me, history's the leveler here. If, the, if there is anything that you've previously estimated that is remotely similar, go back, look at the piece of string and the knots and work out, okay, how long did that take me? Am I being realistic? Um, the last point that I really want to make on this one, and this one was really hammered home by Jean Boyoski, I really hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, in the book, 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know. Um, if you haven't got yourself a copy, do, it's awesome. You don't need to read it front to back. You can just dip in and out like I do. Um, but Jean pointed out that done is a binary state. And honestly, my mind was blown at that point. I have spent my whole life going, oh, it's kind of done, it's nearly done, it's done tomorrow. Yeah, it'll be done next week. And I just stopped there and then. I was like, it's done or it's not done. There's no in between. There's no nearly done. So, and for God's sake, done, done is not a thing either. So <laughs> it's done or it's not. And I would really encourage you to remember that when you're estimating and when you're, you're giving that feedback because nearly done or done tomorrow can send a message that perhaps you don't always want to be sent. Okay, third and final myth. Developers don't need thanks or additional reward because we love our jobs that much. Um, it's wrong, obviously. It's also shockingly prevalent. Um, I've seen it time and time again. It's especially toxic in sales-led organizations. Obviously, we need thanks just as much as the next human being. But this really got me thinking about what's our value and we really need to know what our value is. Is it money? But I don't think it is just money, right? I think we really need to choose our, our, our perks carefully. So what's more important to you, right? Is it free food? Is it finishing at two o'clock every Friday of the month? Is it a monthly contribution towards your electricity bill? One of payment for your home office, your birthday office year. I've had all these perks, by the way. Complete autonomy and flexibility, free on-site gym. So what I would say is, are you getting your needs met? Not just the financial ones. Look at the big picture. Look at the holistic view of your business and decide if you, as a developer, are getting your needs met. Don't cut me off yet, Barry, it's my final slide. Okay, so thank you, quick summary, takeaways. Every time I look at this slide, I get hungry now. Um, so point one, ask for your company to invest in you and your skills on an ongoing basis. Number two, challenge what you don't know, look at the history, um, and please remember that done is a binary state. And last of all, know your worth, know your complete package, know everything that you are, and don't be afraid to ask for it. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Any Thanks questions? very much, Helen.
Um, that's the second person actually that's, that's told me they, they hate bananas. I worked with somebody <laughs> once yes. who absolutely could not, like almost had a phobia of, of I, bananas. I, I, there, there, there was a time um, in, my, um, in my previous role in an office where someone actually sneaked up behind me whilst eating a banana. I pretty much lightly screamed and ran to the other end of the office. Wow. Not even an exaggeration. <laughs> Um, does anyone have any questions uh, for Helen at all on, um, on the presentation? Not a question per se, but just to do a plus one on that first one. I think it's one that we, I don't know if it's not being shy or if you feel like, not, shy is not the word, you don't want people to think, oh, so you need time to learn this, you should, you should. You should be passionate about this. You should be learning. Absolutely. On the and it's okay sometimes just to say, I need actual chunk, a chunk of real time. 100%. Yeah, 100%. So I completely agree with our first one. Thank yeah. you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, well, just a reminder then of the uh, the feedback form is there. Um, if you have any any thoughts on, um, on, on Helen's presentation or on Dan's, please do share them. Um, it's so, so useful at this early stage. And again, you made me feel bad there for, for cutting down off Dan. I'm so sorry again. <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's certainly fine. I, um, I, I did the practice run, but that was like uh, before I added five times more content. To <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay, uh, so we are now onto our third speaker. I don't know what's happened with our fourth speaker. We had a fourth tentative speaker. Um, Jamie, I don't know if you're out there. So if you are, um, then. Uh, let me know, um, but I don't know what, what's, uh, if, if that's going to happen or not. So uh, I'm going to move to our fourth speaker, um, Stephen, Stephen Powell. Stephen, are you, are you there? Are you out there? Hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so Stephen's going to be uh, speaking about the, the future of cloud-based music production. Uh, so Stephen is a lecturer in software development, uh, the lead of cloud computing at a college. Uh, he studied creative music technology at undergraduate level and digital composition and performance at master level. Um, and he came forward to us just, what, two, two or three hours ago, um, answered the call. So thank you so much, Stephen. I'll hand over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, as Barry said, I've had a bit of a little time to prepare, so do please forgive me if I um and are ah my way through this. So my name is Stephen Powell. Obviously, you've heard a bit about my background. My degrees, as well as being music oriented, were very uh, technology and coding orientated as well. So it wasn't just me messing about with synthesizer all day. It did require quite a lot of uh, coding. And that's where my love of it began. And when I left uh, my degree, when I finished, I got into music and composition, but very quickly got into technology because that's what I just enjoyed it at the time. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm not a huge expert on cloud computing. Um, I don't currently work coding and developing for the uh, online music production industry. So this is, to a certain degree, an opinion a piece of a very interested person. Um, when I started music production, it was almost totally desktop applications or hardware. There wasn't any uh, mobile applications that really wasn't happening. And I don't think as far as I know, there was any cloud-based applications. The tools I used were quite processor and RAM heavy and hard drive heavy, depending on how you made music. Um, but at that point, computers were okay. Um, you know, they're beginning to get to the point where you could, they could deal with that kind of stuff without having too many worries. Now things have hugely, hugely changed. You have all kinds of applications both on the cloud desktop and online that you can use to make music and in fact i remember reading three or four years ago there's the first example of someone releasing an, an album made entirely on a phone which is really really incredible it's a real achievement um, and that's the state of what we have now just like so many other uh, applications so many other industries we can do it on the go and we can do it without having powerful computers and that's a really fantastic thing some good examples, please excuse, I think the neighbors are having some work done, so sorry about the noise. Um, online, you have a number of what, what are called digital audio workstations, which are main pieces of uh, music writing software that you can drop modules into, so you can use them to make, to host synthesizers or samplers. Samplers are 
instruments that hold a little bit of audio that you can play over and over again, like an electronic drum machine. And they are fully fledged pieces of software for making music. And they're really, really fantastic. You can certainly make a full album on them. Some examples are Audio Sauna, Soundation, Audio Tools. And many of the other pieces of software are small things like individual drum machines or synthesizers or things that warp your voice. And there's lots of really cool, fun things that you can use online. However, there are certain limitations to it. And this is where my interests in music come in. My main interests were in-depth synthesis, and that always required a lot of processing power, which is why they are still mostly limited to desktop applications. Don't get me wrong, you can still make amazing sounds with online synthesis and mobile synthesis, and you don't need a huge amount of power to make great music. That's not the point of it. But I still enjoy really deep sound design, which requires a lot of power. I also enjoy coding for music production and using um, software-based libraries where you can interact and you can take a much more modular approach to interactive music. And that still isn't something that has happened with Cloud. Now I'd like to share an image with you. Uh, I haven't done this before, so share my screen. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, don't worry about that. But I'd like you to think of a classic modular analog synthesizer, which is loads of different boxes all joined together and cables going here, there and everywhere and lights shining here and something happening over here and little screens with oscilloscopes going. And compare that to modern methods of deploying software. So I'm thinking of the cloud and I'm thinking of microservices. We don't have so much huge, great big programs, great Neolithic programs, Neolithic, that's not the right word, um, programs that, um, that do one thing. You have loads of bits that connect together. Um, if you're using Azure or AWS, you've of course got firewalls and virtual networks and virtual machines and all these kind of bits that interlink together. And just like that microservices is the ability to get lots of little bits of code and fit them all together and they're isolated and they can run on their own. And whilst you could probably unpick a lot of reasons why that's not like a modular synthesizer, the idea still speaks to me of how it's interesting, especially the case of functions on demand. So that now you can pace just for computing power. You only have to upload code to run, whether that's data, or whether that is the processing that goes along with designing sound. And it can be anything. And so that comparison of how we work in a modern day situation, in my mind, is very much like the modular approach that you can take to music making. The in MIDI, so the instructions for making a sound, that goes into one place and that does that, and then the sound goes to an effect. And you get this chain of events that I think is actually quite analogous to modern development. And I really do see that as a way that we can take off making music online and not just music, we can think about the visualizations that can come with music, interaction, film. So I think it's really interesting and worth looking into and considering where we go next with modern music production. Is it just pieces of software that we can log into and make music on? Or is it going to go something deeper, something where you can really drill down deep into one specific area and have that feeding into someone else's work? A little bit like how people might collaborate on a song, people might collaborate on the process of creating a sound, of getting, getting much deeper into the concept of making music software in a shared way. So those are my thoughts. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Um, Please enjoy the rest of the speeches today. Thanks, Stephen. Very much appreciate that. Um, does anyone have any, any thoughts, any comments, any questions for, for Stephen after that? Um, ju just a comment. Um, you actually reminded me of, uh, of a very, very cool project that I've seen um, being presented at the, a, a closure conference a couple of years ago called uh, Overtone. Uh, which was kind of, um, it's like a digital sort of synthesizer. And I think they're actually on, on their GitHub page, if you search for Overtone, 
uh, there are actually two bands that are using this to perform live performances, uh, creating sort of like electronic music. Uh, it, it, it's a really, really cool, cool project. I completely forgot about that, but I thought maybe you, you will find that interesting as well. Well, we'll check it out. Thanks, Dan, and thanks.